Let us pray. Holy Lord, we come to you with yet another biblical character that we, who we can learn from. Help us to learn from them, and through learning from them, that we learn from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my! With apologies and all due deference to the Wizard of Oz, and more specifically to the Tin Man and to the Scarecrow and to Dorothy, a theme for this sermon and the last two sermons could easily be Lions and donkeys and whales, oh my. Because we've been on a three-Sunday run of these amazing animal stories. First, Jonah, a few weeks ago, was in the whale's belly, and then last week, Balaam and his talking donkey, and now, today, Daniel in the lion's den. All of these stories that beautifully reveal divine feats of nature, they're all miraculous stories which point, point us towards God's power to help us and to help the world. There's an old saying about miracles and miracles stories, and it goes like this. If you can believe God's first miracle Believing the rest of them is a piece of cake. Next to creation, these three stories and all the miracles, is Daniel in the lion's den, a piece of cake. However, let me start out saying this. Regardless of how you think about today's miracle story or any miracle story, it's important to see what they're trying to do, what they are trying to convey, which is something vital about faith in God, something that protects us from cynicism and losing hope, even, even in the lion's dens of life. So what about this Daniel, this man of amazing faith? Daniel was, as I sort of alluded to, was in the first wave of slaves taken from the defeated nation of Judea. He was taken from Jerusalem when he was just a teenager, when Ju Judea fell to the Babylonians. And so the Israelites, they didn't have a homeland. They didn't have a home. That began a period where they didn't have a home for almost 2,600 years. Think about that for a second. We're talking about God's own chosen people, and they were totally defeated. In God's own home, that's what the Temple of Solomon was considered, which was in Jerusalem. It was destroyed. The whole city was in rubble, but the temple, especially the Temple of Solomon, was in rubble. God's home. And so imagine you were an Israelite in those days. How could you help but think that either one of two things, either God had lost to the pagan gods that surrounded the pagan gods of the Babylonians, or God didn't love us. God didn't love the Israelites anymore and had given up on them. Either way, it certainly looked like God's plan to save the world through his own chosen people it was kaput. It was over. That's what it looked like. Daniel was taken as a slave, and he, this guy was really talented. He rose to become a valued advisor to first to King Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, and then other Babylonian kings after that. And then, something like 60 years later, 
when the Persians defeated the Babylonians, Daniel he again rose to the top, serving, as today's reading says, King Darius. King Darius put him in charge of the entire Persian Empire, which was gigantic. So this talented but also very practical Daniel, who was really he was obviously wonderful at his work, he had this long and very successful career, very loyally serving these pagan kings. And yet, and here's the part, it's, it's actually really odd. It's the odd part about Daniel. Despite serving these pagan kings, kings who worshipped in very ways that, that, that he disapproved of, he remained a devout Jew, faithful to Yahweh, above all else. Now given how badly things had been going for the Israelites, we might ask, very logically, we would ask, why even bother? Why even bother being loyal to a God who at least it seemed at that point had given up on the Jews? Daniel was living in the land of pagan gods. Why not worship one of them? But time after time, and we're in chapter 6 now, in the first five chapters, time after time, in this book of Daniel, he was the picture of devotion to Yahweh, to God. Which brings us now, in chapter 6, to the lion's den. Daniel's pagan colleagues, the three of them, they were set over it. They, when, when Daniel was made numero uno, they were jealous of Daniel's success. And so they, basically what they do is they manipulate King Darius, who really valued, of course valued and loved Daniel. They manipulated him in the, the king into making a law for actually only a period of 30 days, a law that said you couldn't pray to anyone other than King Darius. The penalty for breaking that law was going into the lion's den. But as always, what we see here is that, that, Dar that Daniel, he remained faithful and he ignored that law and he prayed just as he always had. And so into the lion den he went. And we all know what happens next, or more precisely, what does not happen. Now as practical people, we might also ask why Daniel would put himself at such risk, overtly breaking that law. You have to think, come on man, what are you doing? Take 30 days off. No big deal. No one's going to notice. Friends, Daniel lived in a time and a place when the God he worshipped certainly did not seem to be in charge of the world. And so why even bother? Well, friends, we live in a time when Christianity, when our faith, well, let's call it what it is, it's been shrinking. Let's not pretend otherwise. And so many people have wondered, why even bother? Why, why not be cynical? Why not throw in the towel? Why not indulge more practical pursuits on Sunday mornings, for example? Why not pursue other gods or other idols that seem, you know, the kind that seem to be all the rage these days? Like the gods of materialism, consumerism, or demonizing those whom we disagree with. Or indulging in whatever we want, sort of having an, I only care about myself, everybody else, well, and looking the other way when we see misfortune in others, because you know, it's not that practical to help others 
Why was this story of Daniel such an important story to the Israelites 2,500 years ago, and why is it still just as important today? Because it reminds us that no matter how things look on the ground, God, God is still in charge. And also, and maybe even more basic than that, it reminds us just as it reminded the Israelites 2,500 years ago that God, the one who created us, the mighty creator, still loves us and still loved the Israelites back then. And that God is determined to follow through on his plan to save the world. This reading, this story, the great story of Daniel, reminds us that regardless of what we see, God's good will win out. Because God's in charge. Martin Luther King, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he had a, a phrase he'd use from time to time that, that well, and by the way, Dr. King was a man who knew something about living in lion's dens. He had this phrase that's very relevant. He said this. He said, the arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. In the book of Genesis, when God, when God created the world, was finished, and, and, and after that final act of creation, creating of humanity, God stood back, stood back and looked at all that had been created, and God declared it all to be very good. My advice to each and every one of us, don't bet against God. If that's what God wants, if that's what God wants creation to be, that's what God will get. Nihilistic thinking that says, you know, life stinks, and then you die. Nihilistic thinking that says, take whatever you can get away with. That's not the way God thinks. And it's not the way God wants us to think or to live. God wants us to think and live with hope. And God wants us to live seeking to be forces for good in this world. Working with God. Which is exactly, of course, what we Christians are called to do. That is the calling of the church, and that's the calling of Plymouth Congregational Church. I invite you at some point to just look at the cover of the order of worship and our mission statement. It may not say what I just said word for word, but that is the point. Living out God's good. The story of Daniel reminds us that just as Christ's resurrection reminds us that God still loves us and God is determined to save us. Later in the book of Daniel, in this really mysterious, the last seven chapters, it's this mysterious series of visions that, that Daniel has, and in them he gets responses from, the, from, from two different angels of God. And here's the one that I love the most, the response from the angel. Words to live by. Do not fear, greatly beloved. You are safe. Friends, when we believe that God is in charge and that God loves us, it protects us from cynicism and makes us a lot less, a lot less afraid and a lot more bold. Daniel didn't cave in on his faith because he trusted, he believed that God loved him and would help him in some way. 
lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my! The world can be a dangerous and frightening place. But when we have faith, when we believe in the Lord, it's a lot less scary. Even on Halloween. Amen.